In this episode, we are joined with Dr. Philip Roseman to discuss the 12th century theologian and magister, Peter Lombard, and his famous work, The Sentences. Dr. Roseman is a professor and chair of philosophy at Maynooth University. He is the co-editor of the Dallas Medieval Texts and Translation Series, and he specializes in the philosophy of religion and theology, most especially that of Peter Lombard. Dr. Roseman, thank you so much for joining with us today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks very much for having me, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I thought that we might just dive right in. Who was uh, Peter Lombard, and why is he so important for uh, maybe studying the the medieval period? Well, what are some of his significant accomplishments? Well, okay. So, um, Peter, if you don't mind, I'll start off by... uh, and that, that is not meant as a kind of unfriendly gesture. I'll start off by correcting a little bit what you said. Why is Peter Lombard so important for studying medieval Christian thought or medieval theology? I would say Peter Lombard is not just important for studying medieval thought or medieval theology. Peter Lombard is simply one of the great Western theologians. Um, so even if one is not a medievalist, not an expert in the thought of the Middle Ages, one, if one is int- as long as one is interested in Christian thought, in the development of Christian thought, the history of Christian thought, I would even say you could even remove the word Christian if one is interested in the history of ideas of the Western world, Christian or non-Christian. Peter Lombard is important. Um, why is Peter Lombard so important? Well, that's due to the fact that he is the author of the famous Book of Sentences. Um, so first of all, perhaps I should explain the title book of sentences. Now one could say, does not every book contain loads of sentences? <laughs> but book of sentences, sentences is a technical term that was used in the medieval period. So we're talking about the 12th century, of course, where a sentencia, which is literally translated as sentence, is not simply a sentence, but is more something like a sentence in the contemporary English sense in which one would use the word um, in the context of a trial. The judge passed a sentence on you know, the accused or something. That is to say, it's a considered judgment. So a book of sentences is a book of considered judgments regarding the major teachings of the Christian tradition. And so what Peter Lombard did in that book of sentences is collect the, and I'm now going to use this word, the sentences, that is to say the considered opinions or judgments of the church fathers, both Western and fewer, but still Eastern also. So for example, St. John Damascene is important in the book of sentences. So Peter Lombard collects the sentences of the major thinkers of the Christian tradition preceding him. There's loads of Augustine there and loads of um, um, Ambrose also, a lot of biblical references. As I said, a little bit of Eastern uh, theology as well, but not quite so much. He gathers these sentences together, gives them a systematic structure. You know, see, that is important. Um, it's surprising that if you look at the we- development of Western theology, and there the East is a little bit different, if you look at the development of Western theology, you will find that until the 12th century, theologians produced biblical commentaries, and they produced treatises on particular individual subjects. So for example, take Augustine, you know, he has a very famous work called on the Trinity, or he has uh, several works devoted to the question of free will and predestination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. St. Augustine doesn't have a theology textbook. It's not among his works. Then if you say, well, that was just St. Augustine, well, you go on and look further at the tradition. Theologians or Christian thinkers who produce a coherent vision of the whole of Christian thought are very rare. One example one could give would be the eccentric 
perhaps you'll devote a podcast to him at one point, the eccentric um, uh, ninth century Irish thinker, John Scottus Eugena. He actually with the Periphusion produced something like a synthesis. Now that's very rare, that's very rare. And in fact, what was happening in the Western theological tradition was that until the 12th century, no real need was felt for such a synthesis. That is to say for a work, a book, a series of books, okay, um, which would contain a systematically articulated vision of the whole edifice, if you will, of Christian doctrine. Now, Christian thinkers in the 12th century began to, well, experiment with that, if you will. Uh, I don't know if we may want, we may end up talking a little bit more about that project of the 12th century of building a systematic theology, but be that as it may, so in the 12th century, as various thinkers are, uh, and that's the big project of the 12th century, as various thinkers are trying to build this systematic theology, Peter Lombard comes out with the most compelling one. And why, now one could say, why was Peter Lombard's the most compelling? Well, that's simply the judgment of posterity, because Peter Lombard's book of sentences, which in four volumes tries to uh, give an account of the whole of Christian doctrine, kind of systematically articulated on the basis of the tradition, as I just said, on the basis of these sentences, Posterity came to the judgment that Peter Lombard had accomplished this in the most compelling way, which is why at the University of Paris, starting early in the 13th century, Peter Lombard's book of sentences came to be adopted as the standard textbook of theology. Um, the first uh, uh, master at the University of Paris to move in that direction was the Franciscan Alexander of Hales. So starting in the first quarter or so of the 13th century, Every aspiring master of theology um, in the Western world, really, at every university, has to comment on Peter Lombard's Book of Sentences. And this tradition of commenting on the Book of Sentences continued for hundreds of years, certainly until the Reformation, until the time of Martin Luther, who himself still commented on the Book of Sentences, okay? And depending on now the country, so for example, in Mexico, um, the Book of Sentences was still a textbook even in the 16th century. Um, so generations and generations of Christian thinkers developed their own ideas as to what a synthetic account of Christian doctrine should be on the basis of Peter Lombard's sentences and in dialogue with them. Now, some stayed closer to the Book of Sentences, others diverged more, but they were all, they all knew who Peter Lombard was, they had all read the Book of Sentences, they were all commenting on it, there were thousands and thousands of copies. Um, so, and there is no book in the Christian tradition that played a comparable role. Not even, now you could say, what about Thomas Aquinas and the Summa Theologiae, right? I mean, obviously that's a very, very important and influential work, there's no doubt about that, but did it ever become the standard textbook at all the universities. No, it did not. Um, and so one could say that Peter Lombard is the most influential Christian thinker, or one could put it differently, the Book of Sentences is the most influential book of Christian literature apart from scripture itself. Um, so that's the significance of Peter Lombard. Um, so, and as, so how could one sum that up in just a few words? Peter Lombard for hundreds of years was responsible for the uh, fundamental structure of theological thinking and was the starting point for all theological thought. And uh, if I can also ask, Peter Lombard is often referred to as uh, Master Peter, but what does master uh, mean in, in, in this context? Is it a teaching position? What, what does it mean? Well, in the, medi in the medieval university, it was um, the, the, the expression master or magister designated what we would now call a professor, okay? So the medieval university didn't use the word professor. You, uh, it, this is due to the fact that when the universities were founded or emerged is perhaps a better word. You know, it's not that suddenly a big bell was rung um, and there was an announcement, we're now founding universities. It's more that these emerged. Um, towards the end of the 12th, beginning of the 13th century in places like Bologna, but then of course also Paris, um, Oxford, Cambridge, etc. cetera. Um, when universities had, when this process of emergence, of the emergence of the universities occurred, the question was how universities should be structured. And they ended up being structures like intellectual guilds because universities were 
located in cities, in places such as Paris, Bologna, but then later Cologne, Cambridge, Oxford, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and as these intellectuals were asking themselves, how are we going to structure the kind of education that we're giving, the model that they chose, and you know, one could say the only model that was available was that of a guild. And in a guild, you have young people who begin to work in the workshop of a master. That is to say a master who is already a master carpenter or a master barrel maker or a master shoemaker, etc., etc. And so they begin as apprentices, um, make it up to the level of perhaps journeyman, which would at the university correspond to bachelor, uh, and then eventually, perhaps they'll open their own workshop where they will be authorized by the guild uh, to uh, also take apprentices, um, but operate their own workshop as master. So this title Magister is a title that comes from the guilds, that is to say from yeah, um, kind of organizations in which manual workers organize themselves, and that was transferred to intellectual work. Um, and so that's, that's why in the medieval university, the, the major teaching position is called the position of the master. Peter Lombard is called master. It's a honorific title. I mean, he was a master. He was a master at the Cathedral School of Notre Dame, which was not quite yet the University of Paris, but was just a few decades removed <laughs> from the foundation of the University of Paris. And the Cathedral School of Notre Dame was going to, was later absorbed, absorbed into the University of Paris. But at any rate, so Peter Lombard was a master in that school and um, continued to be referred to as Master Peter because he had this title, but also because he came to be the master of all theologians. So you wanted to learn theology, well, in whose workshop were you going to learn theology? Well, in the workshop of Master Peter, because he had written the Book of Sentences. So that's how he gets this title. Where does uh, Peter Lombard receive his education? Is it at one of these uh, sort of primitive universities that, that he gets his education? Or? It's, it is mostly in Paris. I mean, so Peter Lombard, as the name indicates, wasn't French, he was from Lombardy. So, you know, he was from the north of Italy and began his education there. Education meaning something like a cathedral school where uh, gifted kids <laughs> in the Middle Ages would begin to study things like Latin grammar, the, the trivium and the quadrivium, really. But then as, um, as uh, his, yeah, his superiors, really the Bishop of Lucca, uh, Lucca was the major cathedral town there together with uh, Novara in Lombardy as uh, Bishop Hubert of Lucca, where Peter Lombard must have been studying, discovered that Peter Lombard was gifted, um, he sent him on to further study to France. Why to France? Well, because the schools of France at that time were already, um, were considered to be at the cutting edge of biblical and theological research. And so Bishop Hubert of Lucca equipped uh, Peter Lombard with a letter of recommendation sending him to Reims uh, in the north of France. Mm, why to Reims? Well, Reims had a famous cathedral school. That's one thing. Another thing, it, it, it was close to Laon, Laon, which is spelled L-A-O-N, Laon, um, where um, an important project was occurring at the time. The project was the project of making a glossa ordinaria, um, I'm not sure. Have you have you heard of have you heard of that? Like what a glossa ordinaria is? Well, I, I, as I understand it, glosses were like uh, weren't they commentaries on like the Pauline epistles or or or, or uh... right? So I'll elaborate a little bit. So um, uh, Bishop Hubert sends Peter Lombard to Reims, Reims with its cathedral school, but also Reims because of its proximity to Laon where people like the famous Master Anselm of Laon was working. And Master Anselm and his school were engaged in the process of, find, of preparing a collection of glosses on scripture. So, hmm, scripture. Scripture consists of lots of books, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, but obviously for Christian education, in the patristic period, in the medieval period, and by the way, still today, scripture is not exactly unimportant. You want to know what the various parts of scripture mean. 
So how do you go about that? Well, you gloss the books of scripture. Gloss means that you write in the margins or between the lines in order to explain what the various parts of scripture mean. A gloss can be interlinear. It can be between the lines. And these glosses are often short. So whatever. St. Paul uses an expression, um, you know, uh, Christ lowers himself in the letter to the Philippians or something. And then explanation, what exactly does this word mean? That would be an interlinear gloss. Or perhaps in the beginning was the word. And then, you know, a glossator would say, well, in Greek, that is logos. And we translate it as verbum. And then just briefly, what does it mean? But then a marginal gloss would elaborate on that and would try to extract from a few scriptural verses, would try to synthesize those and build them into a theology. Often, not often, actually not often, but always drawing on the writings of the church fathers. So you see what you get, therefore, in the margins of these so-called glossed books of the Bible are accounts of scripture that are based not on the ideas of the glossator who is writing these remarks, but the glossator is someone who synthesizes, pulls together the fruits Sometimes a word used there was florilegia, a collection of flowers. <laughs> the flowers, um, you know, those aspects of the Christian tradition that had flowered the most. Um, you know, Augustine was flowering and Anselm was flowering, etc. And so this was drawn together into the margins. And in the 12th century, for reasons that we may or may not end up touching on, the need was felt for a standard edition of this. Um, so not just have one way of glossing the Bible in one place, one glossed Bible circulating in Paris, another one circulating in Reims, a third way of collecting extracts, of choosing Augustine as opposed to Ambrose, etc. Um, in, 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 what did I say, you know, in Bologna, etc. But to make a standard way, to create a standard collection of glosses. And this was called Glossa Ordinaria. So you can translate that as ordinary gloss, but ordinary in contemporary English has a strange meaning, you know, like, you know, he's a little bit ordinary. <laughs> so ordinary is better translated as standard. Um, and so Peter Lombard was sent to uh, Reims, Long, because he was really close to a cutting edge theological project at the time or cutting edge project of biblical scholarship at the time. And that was to make this set of standard glosses which was to become really important for Peter Lombard himself. Well, because you see, what is theology? Well, theology basically is, once you get a systematic theology, in particular as Peter Lombard did it, it was conceived, you pull these glosses that have accumulated over the centuries in the margins of scripture, you pull them together, if you will, you kind of detach them from the scriptural context in order to synthesize them at a more abstract level, right? So that as long as you're commenting on scripture, you're tied to the narrative flow of scripture, okay? You know, St. Paul, letter to the Hebrews or something, and you follow the argument or the, the train of thoughts as St. Paul develops them there. That's very interesting and very important, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't give you a systematic theology because for systematic theology, the topics on which St. Paul touches in the letter to the Hebrews needs to be compared with, well, other scriptural passages, passages in Augustine, passages in the New Testament, passages in the Old Testament, passages in Eastern church fathers. It has to be articulated in a more theoretical abstract way at a kind of higher level. And that's what Peter Lombard was doing in the Book of Sentences, so that uh, being acquainted with the Glossa Ordinaria was a crucial step for him as he developed towards this more uh, systematic vision of theology. So that was one step in his education, an important step. He uh, spent some time, look, I mean, as you know, uh, about these medieval figures, but also sometimes church fathers, we don't, uh, we don't, we don't usually have precise records of such and such a year when the person was, it's often by accident, you know, a letter survived, which carries a date or a person, a, a, a title is used in connection with a certain person, a title that the person can only have possessed. 
in the period from this year to that other year. So dating is always a little bit tricky and certainly trickier than it is with modern people. But at any rate, so Peter Lombard spends some years at uh, law and then he gets another letter of recommendation, a very famous one, where you always needed letters of recommendation. So you couldn't just go to Paris and knock on, some, the, do on the door of some abbey or monastery and say, hi, I'm Peter Lombard, you know, could I have a room? <laughs> you, you needed a recommendation. And so uh, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux gave Peter Lombard a recommendation, a kind of introduction, a letter of introduction to the Abbey of St. Victor in Paris. So that was the next step, if you will, in his education. Um, how does he get to know Bernard of Clairvaux? We don't know. Uh, so, you know, Bernard of Clairvaux gets to know him and comes to realize this is, you know, a, a very promising intellectual. Um, to whom I want to open further doors so that this person can continue his education. So that's how it must have been. And so Bernard writes to the um, um, canons regular of the Abbey of St. Victor in Paris and says, well, you, you, you know, the letter is available, is actually available, the letter is transmitted, so one doesn't have to speculate. So I'm just paraphrasing it in modern English. Hello, this is Bernard of Clairvaux. You know, I would like to introduce here my friend Peter Lombard. Why don't you look after him while he pursues some studies in Paris? So that's the gist of this letter, okay? Um, so Peter Lombard then is associated, again, we don't know exactly for how long, but for some years is associated with the Abbey of St. Victor. Did he stay there? Not sure. Um, perhaps he stayed somewhere else and just attended classes at the Abbey of St. Victor, we don't know that. But so he came to be uh, acquainted with the Victorines, the important school of the Victorines, in particular Hugh of St. Victor, um, who was the leading theologian among the Victorines at the time, who was working on his own works of, um, of um, systematic theology. Chia, um, and Peter Lombard during that period will have made contact with, though you can see I'm formulating this cautiously, there's no documentary evidence for this, but another very important master in Paris at the time was Peter Abelard. And so um, Peter Lombard will have known Peter Abelard and will have read Peter Abelard. In fact, we know that because he quotes Peter Abelard, okay? Um, and then what must have happened in his own mind, well, what did happen in his own mind, because we see the result, the Book of Sense, is that he pulled all these elements together, the biblical theology um, into which he had immersed himself at law as he was studying the Glossa Ordinaria, and he was, as, as he was studying under the, the uh, scholars at law who were putting the Glossa Ordinaria together. He then learned how to approach theology in a kind of monastic mode um, from the Victorines, you of St. Victor. But then also he came in, in, into contact with the brilliant cutting edge, but also controversial theology of Peter Abelard, whose distinctive, you see, the Victorines and Peter Abelard were a little bit uh, on uh, opposite poles on a, of, a, of a spectrum there, because the Victorines, well, were canons regular. That strictly speaking, not monks, but you know, they are canons. Regular means living under a rule. Uh, you know, so they, the canons regular have a particular history. Basically, canons at a cathedral, part of a cathedral chapter, who at a certain time say, okay, life at the cathedral, the cathedral chapter is becoming a little bit too lax for our taste. Um, so we are going to give ourselves a rule, an Augustinian rule and live a little bit like monks, so we remain really canons of a cathedral chapter. So, but they are on the monastic side, even if strictly speaking, not monks. Whereas Peter Abelard is on the side of logic. You know, he wants to build a really logical theology. And he's at the side of logic means Aristotle and using the cutting edge dialectical tools to think all these mysteries of the face through. And of course, Abelard is a volatile and later somewhat scandalous personality, having affairs and stuff. So um, Peter Lombard finds himself in between these forces and builds now out of those elements, builds his own theological vision, um, that, which is this book of sentences. And he does this during his own years of teaching. We talked about the term master as master in the cathedral school of Notre Dame. Uh, and so after many years of teaching there, Many, I mean, not 30 or something, more something like 10 years of teaching there, 
because he did not get to be really old, Peter Lamba. But after you know a good number of years of teaching there, he comes out with the book of sentences and presents the book of sentences to the world as the textbook he is using for his own theology lectures. Uh, but then, of course, people get excited about it. And we talked about this a little bit a, a minute ago. They said, oh, my gosh, that's really a very good synth synthetic account of Christian doctrine. And it came to very quickly spread beyond the Cathedral School of Notre Dame and beyond Paris. And before long, before but after after centuries, it ended up in places like Mexico. What would you say were um, the main theological voices on or, or influences on Peter Lombard's thought and writing style? I know we talked about how you just said there's the, there, there's the Victorine theologian or Victorine canons regular and uh, Peter Abelard, but what was Augustine at all influential or, or or some of the early church fathers at all? Absolutely. Uh, so if you look at the book of sentences, it's um, perhaps we'll get to that. It's, it's um, a systematically arranged string of quotes from the great voices of the Catholic tradition. Now, mostly scripture, followed by Augustine, um, Hilary, Ambrose, St. John Damascene. I would say those are the major influences in the book of sentences. I see. But I mean, but, I mean so scripture, Augustine, <laughs> uh, really uh, are the, but, but the, the, what should I say, the, in terms of even quantity, um, um, the, the sources that are most often quoted in the book of sentences. Is Aristotle at all available in, uh, or at the very least, the, the, the logical writings, the organon? at all available at Paris at this time? I know you talk about Peter, Peter Abelard was one person who was working on these. Yes, yes. So the organon, the logical writings are increasingly available. We're talking about the middle of the 12th century now. And there were scholars such as Peter Abelard who were really excited uh, about Aristotelian dialectics. Uh, other writings by Aristotle came to be available later after Peter Lombard. So the Nicomachean Ethics, the Metaphysics, etc., came to be available only towards the end of the 12th, beginning of the 13th century, and then also exerted a major influence. Take Thomas Aquinas, whose thought would not have been possible without Aristotle's Metaphysics, without Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, that is to say, without a fuller knowledge of Aristotle. So, but Peter Lombard knew the Organon, but didn't really like it. Uh, so, well, he didn't really like it because you see, the question was, and that was a little bit also the tension with Peter Abelard, what kind of theology do we build? Do we build a theology whose inspiration is fundamentally still biblical? Um, or do we build a theology where logical tools, um, you know, strictly formulated syllogisms, um, play a much larger role? And you see, that was a struggle, well, yeah, a struggle that, um, that occurred in the 12th century, but that continued into the 13th with the contrast of figures such as take Thomas Aquinas on the one side and on the other side, somebody like Bonaventure. Now, both Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure know much more Aristotle than Peter Lombard would have known, but they also have very different attitudes. Thomas Aquinas, well, of course, is inspired by scripture. That's obvious, and by Augustine. I mean, he's a Christian thinker, but he incorporates deliberately massive amounts of Aristotle, and therefore gives his theology a much more rational flavor. So theology is no longer simply, let's try to articulate some biblical truths at a slightly more systematic level, but let's try to show the logical coherence of this edifice of Christian thought. That's Thomas Aquinas. And then you have in the 13th century, somebody like Bonaventure who says, especially towards the end of his life, no, this is horrible heresy, get rid of this Aristotle, who was just a pagan. Um, and so, well, again, go back to the 12th century, and you have a similar um, polarity, if you will, among Christian thinkers. Take, look, take um, Abelard as the ex example of somebody who is very dialectical, is very inspired by logic, wants Christian thought to be as logical as possible. And then the opposite pole would actually not be Peter Lombard, would not even be the Victorines. It would be Bernard of Clairvaux, because Bernard of Clairvaux is the antipode, really, of um, Abelard, and also got Abelard uh, uh, condemned and stuff like that, because, uh, well, he may have objected to Abelard's personal comportment, but that wasn't really the that wasn't really the heart of the conflict. The heart of the conflict was what's theology and how do we do theology?
I see. So if I can maybe uh, shift the conversation a little bit to discussing uh, maybe more so Peter Lombard's writings themselves. I, I know we talked about how uh, Peter Lombard writes these, these glosses on the Pauline epistles or, or the Psalms. Are these at all maybe precursors to the sentence commentary that, that, that he'll eventually write? Or what, what would you say are the significant points about the glosses that he writes? Yes, well, I mean, I think you already summarized the significance. Uh, so uh, earlier on in his theological career, Peter Lombard composed glosses on the Psalter and on the Pauline epistles, um, which was, well, a kind of, that sounds perhaps dismissive, but it's not meant that way. I, I wanted to say so it was a kind of standard exercise for a theologian of the 12th century. You make your own glosses on the Psalter, where making your own glosses, I think, that's clear at this point, doesn't mean you make this up. <laughs> Rather, making your own glosses means you make your own selection of glosses. You make your own synthesis. You think through for yourself material that you found in the Glossa Ordinaria um, in order to, well, you see, it's a very typical understanding at the time of what tradition is. What is tradition? Well, tradition isn't it isn't. I come up with my own original thoughts about St. Paul's theology in the letter to the Hebrews. That would have been frowned upon totally. But rather, doing theology is, I take up the tradition as it's been given to me, and I synthesize it, I think it through, I rearticulate it for my students, right? Remaining faithful to the tradition, but as I'm rearticulating it for my students, for a new generation of people, <laughs> there are going to be subtle changes. And of course, I'm also well talking about Peter Lombard now. He's an intelligent mind. So he's going to have different emphases. Um, he's going to introduce ideas that are new, that Augustine wouldn't have had, that St. Hilary of Poetry wouldn't have had, right? Okay. But so he makes glosses on the Psalter and he makes glosses on the Pauline epistles. That was standard. Why? Well, the Psalter... Um, is the, what should I say, is the fundamental prayer book of the church in that the liturgy of the hours, which, um, well, every monk, but also which would have been prayed in a cathedral chapter, which even lay people prayed in the medieval period, in the early modern period, um, you know, the breviary, um, uh, the liturgy of the hours consists, I don't know, is it 90% or 80%, something like that, of quotations from the Psalms. And so therefore, in order to learn how to pray and understand what you pray, you want to comment on the Psalter. You want to understand. And then also, of course, commenting on the Psalter means for a Christian, how does God's word, as it comes to us there in the Old Testament, already prefigure the incarnation, Jesus, and the New Testament? All that's a task for the theologian who comments on the Psalter. And then the, uh, gloss are the glosses on the Pauline epistles, well, that's where Christian theology starts. <laughs> in the Gospels, you have the narrative, the four narrative accounts of the life of Jesus. Already with, for example, the Gospel according to John, it becomes more theological, obviously. Less just story, but already in the beginning was the word and all that. Um, but then in the Pauline epistles, we are one generation from that. And intelligent Christian thinkers, people like St. Paul, begin to build theology. That is to say, to synthesize the Gospels and to think about particular topics. You know, if you think about Galatians, um, you know, uh, works and faith and works and grace and that type of thing. And so therefore, for a theologian, commenting on the Pauline epistles is a very good exercise in, in um, New Testament theology. Really. So, and yes. Uh, what what uh, scholars have found is that Peter Lombard lifted portions from his glosses on the Pauline epistles and on the Psalter out of these works and placed them in the book of sentences. So the book of sentences, well, but you see, again, as I've already said, tradition didn't work or doesn't work in the sense that I come up with all these original thoughts, but I put material together. So Peter Lombard takes material from his own glosses and transfers them into the new context of the book of sentences where they take a new place. Um, but so he, he starts thinking towards the book of sentences, towards this systematic theology while he's composing these two sets of glosses. If you don't mind my saying one thing, you know, one, um, Peter Lombard is at this point well known. 
um, there was a time, uh, even in the 20th century, I would say in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, when if you had asked a Christian intellectual about Peter Lombard, the person would have said, oh, Peter Lombard, he wrote us wrote this boring and completely insignificant textbook and you know, just forget about him. That's certainly, that's no longer the case now. Thanks, by the way, largely to the work of um, uh, a scholar who's now at Yale, she's uh, uh, now elderly, uh, she's called Marsha Kolisch and wrote two big volumes of Peter Lombard and spent a good portion, not all of her life, she's done a lot of other things also, spent a good portion of her, of her life working on Peter Lombard. But so a lot of work has been done on Peter Lombard and is now being done on the whole tradition of the book of sentences, all the commentaries over the centuries, etc. But you know something that's still almost completely unknown, the homilies that he gave, his sermons. Um, since he was well a priest um, and a canon in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, he, he gave homilies, um, which have been transmitted, which exist, but they haven't really been properly studied. And the book series, which you were kind enough to mention towards the beginning of our conversation today, the book series that I co-edit with a colleague of mine in Dallas, um, has a project uh, underway where uh, a few scholars are working on a new uh, English translation, new Latin edition also, and then commentary on the whole body of Peter Lombard's homilies. So that's basically what we have from Peter Lombard, the two sets of glosses, the homilies and the book of sentences. So then if I can turn to uh, Peter Lombard's most famous work, the, the sentences, what would you say uh, are Peter Lombard's sentences? Are, are, are they at all the same as, as the earlier glosses or are, do they represent a sort of shift in uh, uh, theological literature? Well, I mean, uh, well, I mean, they definitely are. You see, there is definitely a step away from the glosses. So the, the glosses follow the order of scripture. Hmm? Glosses on the epistles of St. Paul uh, follow, first of all, the, the epistles and then the verses within the epistles. So the theologian can't come up with a logic that is different from the logic of the biblical text. And that's ultimately, well, of course, letters of St. Paul already have a theological logic. Um, but if you take something like a Psalter, well, there's no logic there. A Psalter is a song. It's a prayer, it's praise of God, etc. And so if I write glosses on the Psalter, and my glosses don't have, a, don't have a theological, they don't have a logic to them. <laughs> they rather try to offer commentary on what is praise, okay? What the book of sentences does is it abstracts from the order of scripture, which one could call perhaps a narrative order in the case of the gospels, in the case of the Psalter, you wouldn't have a narrative, but it's a certain, order of praise, if that even exists, I'm not, you know, it's a, it's a different literary genre. And the book of sentences organize the material in terms of what one could call the logic of the Christian faith. Now, the logic of the Christian faith, of course, that was a big project at the time. What comes first? And what comes last in the logic of the Christian faith? You see, that's an interesting question. What do I deal with first if I'm a Christian? Um, for example, Peter Abelard was experimenting with that, with that question. If I want to give an account of the whole of Christian doctrine, where do I start? Where do I end? Peter Ab and people were experimenting. And the answer is not totally obvious. One way is, in, in one of his works, Peter Abelard says, well, everything is faith, hope, and charity. So I articulate everything in terms of faith, hope, and charity. Another way of articulating all of Christian thought would be to articulate from creation to last things. It all starts with creation. It all ends with last things, eschatology. Um, and by the way, that is the order that it, it's, it's an historical order. You know, everything starts at creation. That's, uh, that's the order that Peter Lombard does adopt. It sounds very historical, but there's also more of a logic there. Even Thomas Aquinas adopts that order because you know, the Summa Theologiae is an elaborate commentary on the Book of Sentences. Perhaps you, you know, I don't know if you were, you were, you were, you were guests who talked about Thomas Aquinas pointed that out. Um, the, the Summa, Thomas Aquinas himself wrote a commentary on the Book of Sentences. So he commented on Peter Lombard, just as every aspiring master did. Um, and then he, beca he became dissatisfied with the Book of Sentences and said, okay, that's no longer at the height of, theological discourse. And then he makes, then he creates the 
Zuma Theologiae, the Zuma, but the Zuma is not completely, but kind of 80% of the Zuma mirrors the structure of his own commentary on the Book of Sentences. So even the Zuma Theologiae is a commentary on the Book of Sentences only at a slight distance. But at any rate, sorry, now coming back to Peter Lombard there, Book of Sentences, so what is it? Well, you know, it starts with, uh, oh, well, okay, let me try to articulate this a little bit more systematically. So how does one build a systematic theology? Lots of discussion in the, in the 12th century. A kind of consensus seems, well, consensus one could say, Peter Avila does it a little bit differently. So one way of doing it is you begin with creation, you end with last things, but that's still historical. And in a certain sense, you're still going from the first page of scripture to the last page of scripture. So that's still very biblical. And theologians were trying to be more logical. And that is to say, not just follow the books of scripture, but what does logic mean? Well, so for example, I'll give you an example. Take the Trinity. The Trinity does not literally occur anywhere in scripture. There is no passage of scripture which says, now Jesus was talking about the Trinity. It's not there. It's a later, you could call it invention, but I don't mean that in a kind of horrible sense. Uh, it is a theological term that came up uh, apparently with Tertullian, so later. So if you want to think about the Trinity, you can't really take as your point of departure any one scriptural passage. What you have to do is you have to look at all the passages of scripture where there is mention of the father, perhaps the father as creator, but then there's mention of course of the son, and then there's mention of the spirit whom I'm leaving behind for you when I leave you, etc., etc. So you pull all these passages from different scriptural books, and of course, you know, medieval thinkers were convinced that there was talk about the Trinity in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, Jewish thinkers would, would not be so pleased with that, but that's what Christian thinkers were convinced of. Um, so, and you pull references to the three persons from various books of scripture. Then you combine that with reflections of Augustine on creation through the word or the presence of the spirit etc., and other church fathers. And you try to build that into a little treatise on the Trinity, okay? And so that's what Peter Lombard does in the book of sentences. But now the thing is, he doesn't just have a treatise on the Trinity. That would be something like Augustine's De Trinitate. But he has a treatise first. Okay, God is the creator. So let's talk about God as creator. Let's invoke scripture, Augustine, blah, 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 blah. Then let's talk about God as Trinity. Okay, a Trinity means three persons. So let's talk about father, son, and spirit. And then ta let's talk about things such as, that's a famous teaching of Peter Lombard, the connection between uh, uh, spirit and charity. So what is it when we love God and neighbor and how is that connected with the Holy Spirit? And so that's essentially the first book of the book of sentences. It is an investigation of God, both God in terms of God's essence, but also in terms of the three persons. Then in book two, Peter Lombard moves on to creation. So God has an existence, if you will, in himself, and that is Trinitarian, but then also God creates. What does God create? How does God create? Was it really done in six days or are we dealing with six steps, et cetera, et cetera. Then, unfortunately, shortly after creation, the fall occurs. What are the implications of the fall, Adam and Eve? How were they before the fall? How are they after the fall? Um, then what about sin and what's the role of the angels? So that's book two. Then in book three, he says, okay, now sin has occurred. Now we need a remedy for sin. So let's deal with the incarnation. And so book three is essentially about the incarnation. That is to say, it's about the word and the word incarnate. But also interestingly enough, it's about virtue because Peter Lombard is convinced, unlike Aristotle, that all virtue comes from fellowship of Christ. So this idea that I can just be some kind of good guy and have no faith. Peter Lombard would say, no, you can't. That's unfortunately not possible. So virtue requires fellowship of Christ. And then in book four, Peter Lombard goes into the sacraments. Um, I, I, I don't think I've been very good now in articulating the logic of this. You can already see, I mean, obviously different parts of theology are de dealt with, it, um, are pulled together into, into treatises. The logic which holds this whole thing together, I'm not even sure I can get into it, comes from Augustine, 
It's a little bit difficult to explain. Uh, Augustine, in his book on Christian teaching, distinguishes things from signs, and then he says some things are to be used, other things are, go are to be enjoyed. And Peter Lombard, at the beginning of the book of sentences, says that he wants to divide his theological material in those Augustinian terms. And so what I would now have to do, I can do it if you want to, otherwise I'll leave it by the side. I could try to articulate what I just said about the content of the four books in terms of thing and sign and use and enjoyment. And if I did that, then we would have the structure of Peter Lombard's theology as he conceived it. That's perfectly uh, fine with me. I, 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 I particularly am interested in the distinction between uh, thing and uh, and, and sign because I, I'm doing, I hope to do some work on semiotics uh, in, in, in the future, but, but yeah, that, 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 that would be appreciated. Oh, well, semiotics, well, that's of course, yeah. But thing and sign, well, Augustine, uh, again, in, in, at the beginning of the Christi, uh, beginning of De Doctrina Christiana on Christian teaching, um, makes this famous distinction between things and signs. So uh, essentially signs are things that point beyond themselves. Whereas things, well, just sit there being things. They don't have any, they do not point beyond themselves. But then as Augustine asks himself, in, on the face of it, you could say, that's a very clear distinction. So for example, a person is a thing, a word is a sign. But Augustine would say, all right. But then if you look at it more closely, even things point beyond themselves um, because they carry meaning. Um, in particular, Augustine would say, everything that is part of the created order points beyond itself ultimately to the creator, which means that now the whole distinction between things and signs could just be just made. We're already losing our hold of it. And we find that really the only thing that really doesn't point beyond itself is God himself. God is not a sign of anything, not even of himself. God is just a thing. Um, and then in terms of the structure of the book of sentences, this means that's book one deals with the only thing, the only reality that does not point beyond itself, and that is God. And then in book two, we get into the way in which this thing, God, creates all these signs that point back to God, and that's the created order. And then in book three, we get into the word incarnate, who is God, and yet lived among us to point to God. So Christ is that thing that is sign. And in order to help us find God, Christ instituted all those sacraments that really are signs. But again, they're not trivial signs in the sense of, well, you know, let's point out the way to Malengar. That's the town close to where I live here. But take something like, well, the Eucharist. Interesting. The Eucharist is itself thing. It's actually the presence of Christ. But nonetheless, points to something beyond it, um, to, for example, the eschatological reality of life with Christ in the beatific vision, etc. So the sac even the sacraments are not, well, the Eucharist is different, but if you take, let's say, baptism, well, God is not contained in baptism. So there you have more of a sign that points to God and helps us helps us live in fellowship of Christ and through fellowship of Christ discover what real charity is, that is to say, living in communion with the Holy Spirit, live virtuous lives and really become Christians, etc. So that, that was my attempt to articulate the structure of the four books of the book of sentences in terms of the distinction between things and signs, which runs parallel to Augustine's distinctions between use and enjoyment. Uh, uti and fui. Augustine claims rightly so, that there's only a single thing in the world that we're allowed to enjoy, um, and that's God. Everything else, and of course it's an interesting question, can't be enjoyed for its own sake, but ultimately must point to God. Of course, then a question becomes, what about other human beings? So they're just, you know, consider a situation where you are with your best friend or something, and you know, the person asks you, so what do you see your relationship with me being? And you say, well, you are a tool on my way to God. And the person would say, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so you know, on the one hand, that's very nice. On the other hand, no. So you see, Peter Lombard would then say, no, people who have virtue, virtue can 
are a tool on the way to, but they also must be enjoyed for their own sake. If, if you will, there is already enough of a likeness of God in them that there is this basis for enjoyment made in the image and likeness of God. And the more, of course, we um, assimilate, we come to be assimilated to charity, the more we become godlike, the more reason is there to enjoy another human being because the image and likeness of God becomes more and more perfect. So that's a little bit the structure of the four books of the book of sentences. No, that makes sense. And then if I can ask, when Peter Lombard lays out his answers to maybe questions or opinions in the sentences, are there times where he's uh, inconclusive in, in his answering? I, I know that one of the big ones is, especially with Christology, he, he's rather vague about uh, what his actual opinion is. He gives like three different versions of a Christology. Sure, sure. Look, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. You know, that is part of the, in my opinion, part of the brilliance of Peter Lombard. You could say it's a shortcoming, but you know, I'm not so sure. So Peter Lombard will take major, major mysteries of the Christian faith, such as the incarnation, will do what he can on the basis of biblical passages, on the basis of church fathers to elucidate the faith as much as he's capable of. And then at the end, he will often, not always, but he will often say, and this is a mystery which so transcends the capacities of the human mind that ultimately we don't know. So this has two, now, well, one, one could be, what's the word, a bit nasty and say, okay, so let's just go on into, let's say, another century, P. Thomas Aquinas, and he actually has the answers. He doesn't constantly say we don't know. Okay. I, I don't really see it that way. I would say there are two things going on. The first is a very healthy dose of, of negative theology. Um, theology always has two modes. One mode is positive theology. We can say things about God because God has revealed himself in creation, in scripture, in his son. But still, even though this revelation is real, our minds are still merely human minds, which means that whatever is revealed always is much, much, much more than we can actually grasp. And that's the negative theology. And so there is in Peter Lombard always this element of negative theology, um, which makes him say, Yes, I can say five pages <laughs> about the incarnation. And then at the end, I have to admit, it's not enough. I have not understood what's really going on here. This has a, an additional advantage, apart from humility, in the face of um, the reality of God. But the other advantage is, you see, why was it that over centuries, theologian after theologian after theologian could use Peter Lombard as textbook? Because in many, in, most, in many cases, again, not in all cases, but in many cases, he doesn't commit people to an opinion. He will say, look, this is what Augustine says, and this is what scripture says, and this is what Hillary says, and this is what Ambrose says, and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of an invitation, and now what do you think? <laughs> um, which means that it is, to some extent, open-ended, allowing other theologians to use the book of sentences as a kind of mine, of quotations, of material, of the kind of state of the art of tradition, and then to come up with a synthetic answer of their own. If I can then ask, how were the sentences received uh, during Peter Lombard's time? Were they at all controversial or was there any controversy or, or censor regarding his opinions that, that were expressed? There was controversy, um, which is perhaps, in, well, in the nature of, well, or should I say intellectual discourse? So there was this big project of the 12th century of developing a systematic theology. And different theologians came up with different ways of doing this. And so there was controversy and they accused each other. Well, you know, sometimes they just said they were wrong, but you know, sometimes they accused each other of heresy and stuff like that. So, you know, sometimes theologians perhaps, what should I say, get a little bit too enthusiastic in, um, in finding fault in, in the works of others. Peter Lombard's um, positions in the Book of Sentences are, have been recognized as or are considered orthodox in, every, in, in, in all instances with one exception, with one exception. And that's a position about which, and that's also funny, it's not even 100% clear that he taught it. In book three of the book of sentences, one of the questions that Peter Lombard asks is, and it sounds, it's very technical and in a certain sense, 
It's also where too much logic can actually lead you. So if in theology you try, oh, let me understand this logically, instead of being more prayerful and spiritual about it. So anyway, the question is, what is Christ in so far as he is human? So Christ is both human and divine. And now we can, it's already a logical abstraction. We can say, now let's not take Christ as a whole person, but let's say Christ in, in so far as Christ is human. What is he? Peter Lombard would say, is he even anything? And then he says, you know, is he a person? But you see, the person, that's already the two natures, the human and the divine nature. You can't say Christ as human is a person. Okay, person is God. Is Christ as human a substance? Well, then Christ, simply this human aspect, would be a substance of its own. He says, no, no, it can't be that. And so he seems to say, Christ as human is nothing. And this is termed Christological nihilianism and was condemned. Um, I, you know, so it was condemned. So we're not supposed to be Christological nihilianists. But I don't think that really we would be terribly tempted to be. Um, <laughs> it's a very, very small logical point that I don't know. I find it a bit amusing. Perhaps I shouldn't find it amusing. I, I do think it's an instance of tri just driving logic too far. Um, you know, you, Christ just as human would be what? What is the answer, actually? That's not completely clear to me. And it wasn't clear to Peter Lombard, and so he said, well, perhaps Christ just as human is nothing. And then um, uh, um, popes and councils who, what should I say, were full of praise and approval for the book of sentences said, no, 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 no. Christ is nothing. We're not going with that. Or even Christ as human is nothing. We're not going with that. So that's the only part of the book of sentences that's not considered orthodox. One other teaching of Peter Lombard is very, the other teachings of Peter Lombard that are controversial, but contro you see, an interesting thing about theology that I find is, is, you see, sometimes people looking at theological discourse from the outside, in particular perhaps, I don't know who it, who it would be, think it's all terribly dogmatic. And in the case of Catholic theology, it's all, you know, it comes from Rome and you basically have to repeat what, you know, the latest Roman encyclical says. Well, that's not how it is. You know, I mean, there is doctrine, there's defined doctrine, but there is a mass of room for creative thinking, um, which means that in relation to, I'll give you one example, where Peter Lombard holds a position that is not the mainstream position anymore, that is no longer the mainstream position, but it's also not un unorthodox, and it would be interesting to explore it. So Peter Lombard says, what, does, what is charity? What is caritas? What is love of God and neighbor? And Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century would say, well, it's a so-called infused virtue, which means it's a little bit like other virtues that we have naturally, but it transcends the abilities of the human nature to such an extent that we have to say it ultimately comes from God, hence a virtue that I can't generate myself, but that is infused, okay? But Peter Lombard says, um, he is aware of this. I mean, he's not aware of Thomas Aquinas, but he's aware of the fact that you can go in this direction. But he says, no, charity is the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. Now you think, okay, so, but I find it totally fascinating, you know? It raises a number of questions. One question is, if I truly love God and neighbor, now the first question is, is that even possible? I mean, you're not, we're not talking about my being nice. <laughs> we're talking about sanctity on a very large scale here. Um, so very, very few people. So. Um, but let's imagine someone is capable of this perfect love of God and neighbor. A martyr would be perhaps in that category, you know? Uh, Father Colby given his, giving his life in the concentration camp for others, you know, would be in that category. And there Peter Lombard would say, basically a deification has occurred. Um, that is to say, um, yeah, it's already the Holy Spirit that lives in that person as a reality. It's not simply this person has lots of virtue. So that's what it means. The charity is the Holy Spirit. And you see, until the time of Thomas Aquinas, that's what theologians thought. And then the introduction of Aristotle with this notion that virtue can be natural made theologians rethink. So they said, okay, there can be natural virtue, but then even virtue that is supernatural perhaps has to be thought along the lines of a natural virtue 
only that it comes from God. <laughs> but it functions structurally like a natural virtue, but it comes from God. Okay. So that's an interesting teaching of Peter Lombard's. Another interesting teaching, you were alluding to this, and it's, you see another point that's very, very interesting. When he talks about theories of the, we would say, hypostatic union, the incarnation, he lays out three views. And it's not clear which of these views he himself espouses because it's a very difficult topic, but also because perhaps he doesn't, perhaps he wants to be careful about what he says. But one of these views, again, never condemned, is the habitus theory of the incarnation, which is based on, I think it's Paul's letter to the Philippians, I think it's 2.7. Um, it's this famous, what is it, a kind of canticle? You know, Christ who has emptied himself and taken on the form of man. I have memorized it now, um, but appeared in the habit of man. I mean, the Latin uh, text has the word habitus there. And so Peter Lombard was speculating. So what does the incarnation mean? Does it mean that the word takes on humanity like a piece of clothing, like a garment? And now from a contemporary perspective, one would say that's totally ridiculous because the hypostatic union is this close connection between divine and human nature in one person. And to say that that's like taking on a human being like a shirt or a pair of pants, no. That's just theologically so totally inadequate. Okay, but what, what if, has it ever uh, occurred to people, just generally, when you read the Psalter or the liturgy of the hours, the language of clothing is totally prevalent almost in every single verse. Well, not every single verse, that's ridiculous, but it keeps recurring, it keeps recurring. So this idea that God clothes us you know, with virtue uh, or that God's hand is clothed in glory, this is extremely prevalent in the Psalter. That's the first point. The second point is, you see, we live in a culture now where our clothes are considered to be completely accidental. What I wear is completely accidental. You go into, let's say, an American supermarket and everyone wears shorts. And you can't tell the difference between the really, really poor person in the shorts and the really, really rich person in the shorts because they all wear shorts and just a crumply T-shirt. But if you go back to, an, to a society where clothes actually indicated who you were, so the rich person wears the clothes that are appropriate for the Lord. The poor person wears the clothes that are appropriate for the peasant. The priest wears the clothes that are appropriate for the diocesan priest. For the priest, now you have the clothes of all the different orders, of the Dominican, of the Franciscan, of the canon regular, of the Benedictine, of the Cistercian, blah, 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 blah. So you can, you look at the person. Now go back a few hundred years. You look at the person and you can see from the clothes who they are. It's completely clear who they are. This is a Cistercian. This is a peasant. This is a carpenter. This is the Lord. And now go back to an idea according to which the incarnation is the assumption of humanity like clothes. That doesn't mean it's totally accidental, but then this means just as, how do you, how do you tell a Cistercian? Well, you look at the habit. How do you tell that Christ was a man? Well, you look at what he appeared like, a man. <laughs> and that's this theory of the, the habitus theory. And as you can see, I'm actually working a little bit on it not in the sense that I'm writing an article on it right now, but I would like to. And I would like to connect this uh, Peter Lombard's theory, which now everyone would think is just completely dated and it just doesn't do justice to the hypostatic union at all. And I would like to think about this in terms of what clothes were in the Old Testament, the New Testament, before the modern age and articulate and re-articulate this theory. And I think what would come out would be actually quite interesting, you know? So if I can then uh, ask, how was the sentences received by the universities in, in Europe? As I understand it, and, and, and you alluded to it a bit, it became required for theologians to make a commentary on the sentences, sort of like a, an equivalent of what we would call today a, like a doctoral thesis. That's right. That's exactly it. Yes. Um, so from the first quarter of the 13th century, that's now talking about the University of Paris. If you ask me about Bologna or Oxford or Cambridge, I think it would be slightly different in each of these cases because education at that time obviously wasn't centralized in the way in which it is now, but um, was more local. 
uh, or proceeded according to local laws and conventions. But let's roughly say from the first quarter of the 13th century onwards, the Book of Sentences became the standard textbook in um, theology lectures. Now, in whose theology lectures? Well, it seems because you see the masters themselves gave lectures, but then also the bachelors, that is to say those students who were on the path, who were on the road to becoming full-fledged theologians also had to give lectures. It's a little bit of what you would now call a teaching assistant. Just as in a modern university, you have the professor, but then you also have graduate students who are, well, you know, writing their dissertations who are on the way to being professors, they would work as teaching assistants. So there was an equivalent to that in the medieval university. And the master, when he was master, would comment on scripture in most cases, because you see there was also controversy. It seems that some masters started lecturing on the book of sentences when they were masters, as opposed to being bachelors on the way to being masters. But then there was protest because, for example, some bishops said, Bishop Robert Grosstest in England said, what, you're lecturing in the main lecture hours? You're lecturing on scripture? You're lecturing on this textbook? That's horrible. And it seems then that, that the convention which established itself was that the masters commented on scripture and developed their theolo theology, therefore scripturally. However, the bachelors in their lectures um, lectured on the book of sentences, which also means that since doctoral theses didn't exist, that this was the way, or one of the ways, for the aspiring theologian to prove himself. So being capable of lecturing on Peter Lombard's book of sentences. So example, again, we were talking about Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas um, wrote his commentary on the book of sentences when he was a bachelor. Um, okay. So the book of sentences became the standard textbook at that level, okay, which means that every master would, in the course of his career, have acquainted himself with the book of sentences and written some type of commentary. Now, one thing that, thing that I tried to do uh, a few years ago in a small book that I wrote, you know, it's a book called The Story of a Great Medieval Book, Peter Lombard's Sentences. I tried to chronicle the way in which the book of sentences was commented upon between something like the 13th century and Martin Luther. And I tried to chart the development of theology through the lens of the sentences commentary. So it's a little bit, well, it's a, what should I say? It's a particular focus. It's not comprehensive, but it nonetheless throws a very interesting light on the development of theology in those centuries, simply by asking the question, how did people write commentaries on the book of sentences? And the pattern is perhaps predictable. I mean, the pattern is this. Initially, in the 12th century, the very first people using the book of sentences as a textbook, didn't actually write commentaries, they wrote glosses. Because you see, it was new to them. And so just with, as with everything that is new, imagine you read a book you've never read before, perhaps you're going to write in the margins. Perhaps you're going to write in between the lines if there's a word you find difficult that you have to look up. So that's glosses. So they wrote glosses. And then the next step in this development was that these glosses, if you don't mind my using a metaphor, they took off from the page and kind of traveled onto pages of their own. So they settled from the margins of the book of sentences onto their own independent pages so that the glosses were now pulled together into a, um, into a what's the word, coherent uh, um, text of its own. So the gloss now begins to transform itself into a commentary. And then the next step is authors write commentaries on the book of sentences where a particular structure comes into existence. I mean, if you look at Thomas Aquinas, um, it's what is Peter Lombard saying here? Okay, it means blah, 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 this and that and the other thing. Then let's look at questions, which we can ask on the basis of this text. So for example, Peter Lombard has a particular view regarding charity. We talked about it just a minute ago. Then Thomas Aquinas in his commentary, but then also in the Summa would ask, what is charity? Is charity the Holy Spirit? Is charity an infused virtue? And then analyze this, in great detail in the typical form, let's say, of the Summa Theologiae. It seems that the that charity is the Holy Spirit. Arguments in favor. It doesn't seem that this is the case. Argument against resolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the kind of standard commentary of the mid-13th century. People like Albert the Great, Bonaventure, Thomas Aquinas would have written these massive commentaries. Massive because all of Peter Lombard is 
comprehensively commented upon, A, and then is dissected through this questioning method, which, which is also a way of pushing beyond Peter Lombard. So by asking these questions, we can develop the theological discourse further. Then towards the end of the 13th century, people perhaps predictably become a little bit bored with Peter Lombard, because you see, this has now already been a textbook for a century, for 100 years. So is theology perhaps in a different place now? Yeah, it is. And they're still using this textbook. Well, so now what's, what commentators are beginning to do is that they focus on the parts they find most interesting. So they will give a quick comment, a quick abstract and say, in this distinction, Peter Lombard says X, Y, and Z. And then they don't ask comprehensive questions on everything Peter Lombard says, but focus on one or two that they find most interesting. Which also means that then in the course of the 14th century, something like a disintegration of theological discourse occurs in that theologians no longer give this, these comprehensive accounts of everything uh, that's of importance and that needs to be treated in the edifice of Christian thought. But for example, folks that are interested in logic, they become very interested in logic. We'll just pick up the topics that are from a logical point of view of the greatest interest. So you could attend these lectures on the book of sentences and come out and not have learned anything about the incarnation, unless the particular lecturer found this to be of interest. And then, so theological discourse also with nominalism, that's a big topic we can't perhaps get, it's connected with this, it's connected with this. So it starts falling apart and becoming really unsatisfactory and everybody's beginning to see that it's unsatisfactory also because it's no longer spiritually edifying. See, the early sentences literature was still spiritually edifying because it's so close to the Bible and so close to Augustine and you know, the great fathers. So you could build a spiritual life by reading the book of sentences and you know, thinking about it. Then if you look at the end of the 14th century, you can't build a spiritual life by, by reading some of these commentaries. They are extremely abstract, extremely, um, what's the word, uh, full of technical terms, logical distinctions that go on page after page after page and that are only you know, marginally connected with the actual theological material. Therefore, in the 15th century, you're beginning to see a return to full scale commentaries on the book of sentences, because there is an attempt to recover the theological tradition, to move away from this treatment of just a few points that are of interest to an individual theologian. So if you look at somebody like the extremely impressive and under-researched and wonderful Dennis the Carthusian. He writes a big sentences commentary, um, you know, along the lines of what some centuries earlier Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure had done. And then, and this is a very interesting case, Martin Luther writes a sentences commentary. Um, it's, not, it's not like uh, Thomas Aquinas or Dennis the Carthusian, it's rather, it's notes, occasional notes. But Martin Luther, is part of this movement back to the book of sentences, back to scripture, away from the logic, from the excessive emphasis on individual points, back to the whole. And Martin Luther actually likes Peter Lombard, likes, for example, the idea that charity is the Holy Spirit. He writes in his copy of the book of sentences, he writes, yes, this is it, you know, and I agree. And then he says, as for Aristotle and all this logic, away with the stinking Aristotle. <laughs> and he says, the stinking Aristotle, I don't want to hear from the stinking Aristotle. We're doing Christian thought here. So you're back now to the kind of controversies that occurred in the 12th century, where Bernard of Clairvaux would have said, he didn't say the stinking Aristotle, but he could have. Whereas Peter Abelard said, I love Aristotle. Um, so this kind of repeats itself, but at a higher level, you know, centuries later at a higher level of theological development. So, and then, well, is the, is the and you know, the, the history, the story of the book of sentences isn't over. Um, so for example, here you have a fellow called Philip Roseman who has spent a decade of his life commenting on the book of sentences. So it seems that it's still a good way of thinking about theology. And I actually think it is, you know. Right, right. If I can ask then, uh, do you have any, recommendations for, for, for source material or people who'd want to study more about the sentences or, or Peter Lombard? Oh, well, look, that's a very embarrassing question, and I think you know it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, thank you for creating this opportunity for me to advertise myself. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, 
it's, I have written uh, two books on Peter Lombard. One is called Peter Lombard. It was published by Oxford University Press. It, it's, it, it is a, it's not a, it's not too long. It's a little bit more than 200 pages. And it's a, what should I say? It's a synthetic summary of the book of sentences. And then another book that followed a few years later is called uh, Peter Lombard's Book of Sentences, The Story of a Great Medieval Book, where I try to write the story of this great medieval book and shed some light on the development of theological discourse between the 12th century to Martin Luther, looking at the way in which these, this genre, this literary genre of the sentences commentaries developed. Well, I figured, I think we've discussed everything that uh, I, I wanted to discuss. Do you have any uh, closing closing remarks, maybe? No, no. Um, look, obviously, Peter Lombard is very rich. There are uh, other topics one could have talked about, but I'm, I want to thank you. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to talk a little bit about Peter Lombard. I hope that some of your listeners will be inspired to um, well, look further into the ideas of this great medieval theologian. And... Um, uh, you know, try to find out a little bit more about the master. Dr. Roseman, thank you so much for joining with us today. Very good. Many thanks. Thanks for having me.